Welcome one and all to RFK All The Way, your podcast for commentary on Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s presidential campaign. This is Matthew Tower, your host, and today I'm joined by our special guest, Del Bigtree, host of The High Wire and a friend of Mr. Kennedy's. Welcome to the show, Del. Thank you for having me today. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure. Excellent, excellent. Well, we first met in April here in Austin at the Independent National Convention. And what a journey it's been these past six and a half months. Bobby's campaign has shined an inspirational light into the dark wilderness of our dysfunctional political deadlock. And he's given Americans a vision of national renewal and healing divisions that feels very aligned with the unifying campaign his father ran in 1968. And it's synchronistic that given the circumstances of our first meeting, Dell, at the convention, I most recently saw you just two days ago, October 9th, when Bobby declared his independence from the two-party system. That is clearly a major element of the corrupt merger of state and corporate power that Mr. Kennedy has dedicated himself to ending and transforming. So Dell, what's your take on Mr. Kennedy being unbound and freed? from the decaying structure of party politics and Bobby placing loyalty to the people above loyalty to party. I think it's the only choice really ultimately that he could make and be and, and continue to be the sincere and transparent human being that I've known for many years. You know, just taking it back a step, what's kind of funny, you know, and, and I may never have this opportunity again, so I guess I'll take it. Is the fact that you brought up that we met at the, you know, the Independent National Convention there here in Austin, Texas, and at that moment, um, I, I had uh, really just been uh, acquainted with Christopher Life, one of the the people that put that together a couple weeks earlier, and just was randomly put on, like, oh, you know what, you'd be a good speaker for this event. I didn't even know what it was, and so I came and did a. I think I was on a panel with Charles Eisenstein. Um, and, um, and, and a couple of other, you know, great minds, Zach Bush. And then Christopher, the last day, I was supposed to just do a little talk. And he said, why don't you close the whole thing out? And um, it was really a unique moment because I had been, I've been in conversations with Robert Kennedy Jr. from the moment he decided to, or was even, you know, having conversations about running for president of the United States. And so that night, I didn't really realize that that was like that independent convention was all about breaking free of the political parties and all of this. Uh, and I've been doing a lot of work with Bobby, you know, supporting him in his run as a Democratic uh, candidate. And so what was amazing was, you know, his announcement, like we found out that I, the moment I found out that he had filed, that he'd actually gone through with it after all these conversations we had, that he'd actually gone through with it, that he's gonna run as a Democrat, I was literally sitting backstage at the independent national convention about to give a speech to this convention that I guess was all set up about breaking free of party affiliation and doing what's right for uh, the country. And I felt really conflicted. Like it, it te the text came through, he's done it. He's just uh, filled out the paperwork, it's official. And so here I am at this independent convention, you know, supporting behind the scenes, really working with a, a you know, I think the best contender for the Democratic nomination. And this video plays before, like, get rid of Republican Party, get rid of the Democratic Party. So I, I have to say that I'm just getting this off my chest because in that moment I stepped up. And I told Christopher later, I didn't really know who to speak to. And I felt like I was being a little hypocritical in that I was speaking to this independent convention, yet supporting a Democratic candidate. So all of that tension and all of that potential guilt was relieved two days ago <laughs> when uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. decided he's dumping both the parties, uh, which was really the heart of that convention. I think it's the heart of the American people. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this nation and the structure in it, and, and, and by the way, if anyone is sitting and listening to this and hasn't you know, seen his speech, go watch the speech. Just turn this off right now. You can come back to this. The speech says it all. And, and what I am so honored, I'm, I'm so honored to be able to consider Bobby a close friend of mine. I've really appreciated the conversations we've had and, you know, about different thoughts and choices. But this is a heartfelt, genuine uh, human being who is the 
honestly, I think he is the perfect candidate in my lifetime. I've never met anyone that is better poised, doesn't need it, doesn't have to have it, isn't doing it for some, you know, self-aggrandizing or ego boost. He genuinely sees the same problems in the world that we all see and that we're all afraid of. And he happens to be one of those individuals very, I think, perfectly designed to handle the problems of this time, whether it's AI or central digital banking or mandated pharmaceutical products or the poisoning of our air or even the use of the environmental issue as an enslavement tool for society. I think that because of his background, he really sees this all with such clarity. And I think this announcement that he just made on Monday declaring his independence and asking all of us to do so, um, I think is the perfect message. I think it's his message. In many ways, I think we look back now that all of this had to go through the process that it did. And I don't think people really understand what a step that is for someone from the Kennedy family to leave that party. Um, it wasn't easy. I've watched the birth pangs of this decision in him for many months. And, um, and I think we all feel his freedom now, as I think we should all feel our own freedom. And that's what this is about. Beautifully said, Dell. And I'd like to offer you just a quick hot take on an aspect of this that might help relieve a little bit of your retroactive guilt. Okay. Which, the way I look at it is Bobby was always an independent candidate for president. He just entered into a political structure, a party structure that was the antithesis of independent thought. Of, you know, instead of like, my, you know, where I'm coming from is our politicians should always do what is right, not what the party says. And so he's coming into it from that standpoint. He wants to do what is right. But when there's an, an orthodoxy that is so entrenched, this you're not starting from the first principle of what's right. You're starting from what the first principle of what the party says. And then when the party makes it impossible for an independent thinker to, to have any chance to win the nomination, I think he put in a good faith effort. And if the Democrats had, in good faith, been willing to run a fair primary, that would have been one thing. But that's not what happened. So, you know, I think he was really always independent, and now he's able to fully step into that. That's just my take on it. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right, and I and I think you know, I think his goal was to, you know, I grew up a Democrat and a liberal, and you know, I think that um, we we all reflect on you know, a sense of independence. I think liberals used to say, I'm an independent thinker, a critical thinker. I think he believed he could return the party to that um, space that, that, that held his, his, his uncle and his father. Um, and, you know, they didn't want to play an honest game. They don't want that freedom. They don't want, they don't want liberty, which is the heart of being a liberal. Um, and I think that um, in many ways, it was the first time. Remember, he hasn't been running in politics. Uh, in this part of it, I think he needed to see how corrupt it really was before he could absolutely make that move. And so you're right. I think that's why we've always loved him. It wasn't he could have gone in any party. Uh, but now I think he's exactly where he should be. And I think it's going to make a lot of sense to a lot of people. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, Dell. So I'd like to pivot to a topic that's more expansive than whether Bobby has a D, an R, or no party next to his name on the ballot, mm -hmm. which is where we're going to be with no party. And that is, what will be the impact on America and the world of a Robert F. Kennedy Jr. presidency? And I'm not, and I'm going to set this up for you before we get into the topic. Yeah. Um, I'm not a fan of Bill Gates, so there's an asterisk, but he coined an aphorism that's relevant to what we're about to discuss, which is that most people overestimate what they can accomplish in a year and underestimate what they can accomplish in a decade. And I think that's also true of a two-term presidency. So with that in mind, Dell, I'd like to set up a, a visionary journey with you, if you're open to that. And I'd like to ask you if you'd be willing to, to just trust me a little bit and close your eyes for a moment. And okay. we're going to do a visionary journey together. And for those who are listening or watching this podcast, you can also close your eyes and go on this journey because we're all going on a Kennedy America journey. So today, Dell, is November 25th, 2032. It's Thanksgiving and you and your family are in the White House celebrating 
with President Kennedy, his family, and all of his special guests as he wraps up his second term in office. So please take all the time you need to really feel into present tense, what is happening in the lives of those you love, your extended community, our nation, and the world. And for those of you at home, you can also feel this. You're in your Thanksgiving space in 2032. Feel it all. And Del, whenever you're ready at your leisure, please, you can open your eyes and tell me what you are grateful for and describe America and the world in real time, present tense language about what you're grateful for in 2032. I mean, you put it in, that's, that's a, there's a big question. I appreciate the question. And I also just want to say that obviously it's just my opinion. And I think the beauty of a dream is that everybody's dream is unique. And I think that what I will be celebrating at the end of a second term of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. that I believe in, that I, that I will be living in a nation and leading a world um, as I think our country always has that opportunity to do, to be a beacon of light and hope, but that it will be in the fact that everyone is allowed to dream again, that we are not having some homogenized, um, implanted dream put upon us, but that we are living in a diverse nation again, a nation where we're allowed to have differences and that it's celebrated that at this Thanksgiving table today, we're having some disagreements and some agreements, but in the end that we can laugh and that this idea of political correctness and, and you know, cancellation, um, that we've been freed of those shackles of judgment of each other, but have returned to the understanding that every human being is beautiful, that our differences are what make us spectacular and our little you know, um, eccentricities and genius moments are unique to us. I think that this nation, in, you know, in eight years, it's, I think it's amazing what could be done in those eight years, but I think we will be living in a nation that is no longer, um, you know, feels like the talking points of humanity are being written by the same five oligarchs that own every news station that is repetitively repeating some mantra none of us are allowed to leave. But I think you will see a vast and powerful, um, you know, probably social media, internet driven community where we are diversified, where many of us get our news and truth from many, many different places that we celebrate what we just learned from our source today. And, oh, I didn't hear that. This is what I heard. And it's acceptable, again, to start informing each other and, and having differences of opinion and realities around what's going on. But I do believe that at the end of that eight years, what we will have is a United States of America where we go out and we both pick up the shovels together and we work side by side and we sweat and we work towards the, the you know, the, the greatness of this great nation, um, I believe we will stop the violent bickering, the violent and aggressive hatred that is only being propagated by uh, a corrupt media system. I think we will return to recognizing our brothers and sisters on all sides of the aisle, whether it's political, whether it's gender driven or racially driven or you know religion. Um, I think that we were a better nation uh, back when John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, you know, were, were working things out. We were working our way through racism. I'm not saying we were perfect, but we were having dialogues. We were having conversations at our dinner tables about the hard things. And we were talking about our politics. And when we do that, we can come together. And I think that we are a nation on the verge of being so divided that we lose ourselves and we lose this world and we find ourselves um, in a very scary place. And I think that when Robert Kennedy Jr. is president, that, that that's going to shift simply because the titles are going to be gone. They'll no longer be, oh, the, you're, you're Democratic president or you're Republican. This will be a choice that we all made together. And we will have to admit that, that we went with an independent spirit, that we decided to celebrate what this nation was about. 
And so we'll, there'll be personal responsibility to it. Robert Kennedy Jr. will not get there because some party funded him to be there or that one of us supported a party or where did the money come from? I guarantee you he's only there because the money came from the people and that the people rose up and decided that they wanted that independent spirit back in their heart again. And so there are difficulties that come with that. You know, I, I talk about my own family. I talk about the fact that, you know, when I, when I raise my kids, I, I'm doing something similar to what my parents did raising me, which is they raised me to always question authority. My parents said that you and in your instincts and in your intuition or who you listen to, there is a connection between you and God and you sit and you pray and you meditate about the things that, you know, are affecting your life and you go with what you feel right about and nobody overrides that. Now, when you raise a child like that to question authority, you have to recognize that the parent is the authority in the room. And so it makes parenting very difficult. And I've done something similar in my house. You know, I want um, intelligent, dynamic children that can grow up and and be leaders in their world. And so, you know, and the rule in my house is, look, if I tell you to do something, if you disagree with it, you are allowed to make a legal, you know, uh, defense against it, you know, and I will hear it out. And if it's a good defense, then, you know, you'll win and we'll move on. This was happening recently. Um, my sister was visiting and my son was having one of his moments where he's pushing back and bringing all the reasons why he thought I was wrong about something I was asking to do. And my sister said, will you just do what your father told you to do? And I was like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. That's not how this works in this family. I said, in my family, he is, he is, he is you know, inspired to make his case. He's currently not making a very good one, and I think he's going to lose, but he's allowed to finish this case out. Um, and I think that that's, you know, what I, I say that because so many of us want freedom, but then watch how we raise our kids. We want them, you know, uh, seen but not heard, as though not being heard is a value that we want as adults, that we want in this world. I mean, this is, this is I'm just getting to the programming and how deep it is in all of us. I was sitting on an airplane and there was a woman with a, a young child. And when the flight was over, the person behind them said, what a beautiful child you've raised. I, you know, I didn't even know they were there. And I remember thinking as I was like listening to that, can you imagine if you as a, in an adult, your child's out in the working world and their boss called and said, man, I just want to thank you on the job you've done. Nobody knows they're there. Um, I think that that's the problem with how we look at, you know, controlling the situation. And when we try to understand why we have almost, you know, moving into authoritarian control by governments, it's the same control every parent wants over their kid. It'd be easiest just to intimidate, to do, use your size and strength and power and the ability to take away your funds and your, you know, your money and stick you in a corner or whatever it is you want to do so that they just do whatever you say. Uh, but that doesn't raise a dynamic child. Uh, but also when you're raising children to be dynamic, there's fights in the house, there's disagreements, there's energy, there's passion. And that is what I see in a great nation. I want passion. Mm -hmm. um, I want us to be able to be passionate. I want that allowed again. And um, I think that it's scary to be a leader in that. And you have to have courage and you have to believe in humanity. You have to believe that deep down people are good and that they do, by and large, make the right decisions, especially when they all have a choice and when the best choice rises to the top, that they're capable of making those choices. Our founding fathers, you know, clearly looked at whether only landowners should vote or everyone should vote. And they decided after, you know, more debates than, you know, and, and critical thinking, thoughtful moments that everyone deserves to have a right to be invested in this process of choosing the leader of this nation. And that's because they believed in humanity. And I, one of the things that I find very, very disappointing about the Democratic Party is though when I grew up in it, I always thought this is the party of the people and the Republican Party is the party of, of industry. Um, and now it is clear that it's no longer the party of the people. It doesn't believe in the people. I do see now this nanny state idea, which is the government makes all of your choices for you. And I speak to friends of mine that are still holding on to sort of these democratic values, and they think people are too stupid to make decisions for themselves, that the world will, you know, go to hell if we allow everyone to really actually have a voice. And so therefore, the government should be the dictating voice. I think that that is so far away from the Constitution of this nation and the heart of this nation, the dream of this nation. 
that the only way to heal it now is to dump the jerseys to take off our red and our blue and our yellow and our black um, to stand together as Americans again. And maybe we go back and rebuild those parties. I think all of this will be very revealing and maybe a party affiliation helps us define who we are in some way. But those definitions are only making us hate now. And I think we should be running from anything that makes us hate our brother and sister. I think this is a really good moment to regroup. And I think eight years from now um, really relies on the first year. And I want to say that, you know, I can't predict the future. I've never been able to. What I can say is this. I have said multiple times that I don't believe. I mean, I speak all over the world. I would have said prior to this year there's no one politician or someone you can elect that changes the world for you. It has to be the people. The people have to rise up and claim their power. Um, I still believe that that's true. But when you look at Robert Kennedy Jr., when you look at the attacks on him by the Democratic National Committee, when you look at the mainstream media propaganda being driven by its allegiance to the industries that are poisoning us, pharma and big ag, big food, the war machine, industrial military complex. These are the things that are attacking Bobby. This is where all the funding comes from every, for every other president. And now that he's turned, you know, the Republican Party probably thought it was really fun to support him when he was a Democrat because it looked like he would weaken the Democratic Party. But watch now, because now they're all afraid. Now Donald Trump is deadly worried that uh, Bob is going to take his votes and spoil the election for him. Biden is, you know, all the articles DNC is saying and the emails are going out that, you know, Bob is going to spoil it for Joe Biden. And as, as you know, Bobby rightfully said in his speech, they're both right. He's going to spoil <laughs> it for both of them. He's going to be the next president of the United States. But when he steps in that office, it won't be because all of the industries finally lined up and, took the bitter pill and decided, well, he's the best we can do and swallowed it and handed him billions of dollars like everyone else. That's never going to happen. It won't be because the DNC or the Republican Party decided this is our best chance. The only reason Robert Kennedy Jr. will be stepping into that office is because the people, enough people woke up in this nation and realized that this may be the last twilight moment to assert their power as individuals before all is lost and individuality is just a dream in the past. And when they wake up to that and do what's right and decide to follow their independent bloodline that runs this nation and, and make that decision, Robert Kennedy Jr. won't be one man working for a machine. He'll be one man representing all the people that woke up. And that is why this is going to be a different nation on day one. That is why that first year, unlike what Bill Gates says, will be very different because this will be a man representing hundreds of millions of voices and ideas. And that alone will be transformational. 100%. 100%. I love that vision, Dell. And I wanted to talk about one thing you, you mentioned at the beginning, which is about families and just share something a bit personal from my perspective. So I grew up in a very intense divorce custody battle. And I've actually uh, written a, a forthcoming book about that. And I believe the health of a nation, especially our nation, especially America, is found in the health of families. So mm -hmm. we've got multiple issues with family breakdown that are happening throughout our country. And you know, one of them is something Bobby has talked about, which is when the government is lying and the media is lying, everyone's at each other's throats, right? Mm -hmm. Because even when we get together around the Thanksgiving table or whatever that table is, if if some members sitting of the family believe the lies they're told and are repeating them, it becomes a very difficult interaction. And I think all of us have experienced that on one level or other. In other words, we're, we're not able to engage even in good faith. A good faith thing is we have shared reality. We have some basic understanding of what's really going on. And then we can express different opinions about that reality. But if, if some people are falling for all these very persuasive lies, it's, it's a terribly toxic environment. So that's one thing. The second is, I don't know if you've ever seen this document, but there's a, a deep state document that surfaced. I believe it was, it was probably CIA. The, do, the document was entitled um, Secret Weapons for Quiet Wars. And it actually reveals that there has been an ongoing agenda in this country to weaken families, to divide us. OK, so, you know, just in terms of a measurable thing, I'd love to see the divorce rate in this country 
50% down, you know, from 40% now it's like in the forties, if it's 20% or less within eight years, oh my gosh, what kind of a change would that be? And just having healthy families on every level, on, on the levels of emotional intelligence, caring, parenting. I mean, people actually, if, imagine what it would be like in this country in 2032, we actually know how to parent and we're teaching that to each other. Because I think for many families, there's this inherited way of parenting that gets unquestioned and it becomes authoritarian. And the kind of parenting you you modeled in your conversation about how you treat your kids, I mean, this is this would be a revolution in our country to have emotionally healthy families um, and, and, and physically healthy. And so that I want to come back to that. Health is, I think, one of your biggest passions. So mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a little bit more just about health from you in 2032. Well, look, you, you put a, a, a very interesting journey there in your thoughts. And so I think they all actually go together. What you really started by saying is how important family is and that you want to see family stronger in America. You want to see the divorce rate go down. Um, I don't know that there's something you can teach people to be better at relationship, but I do know that we're all better in our relationships when, you know, we are able to pay our bills, when we have a roof over our head and we're better parents when we have time to parent, when we can actually spend time with our children and enjoy it. Uh, those are the things that a president affects. The rest of it, family, I suppose you can model and it's really lovely to see the level of love that Cheryl and, and Bobby um, show with each other. It's fun to see them in the interviews that they're doing together. But what's also brilliant is they have been, I mean, they're both public figures. We've all known when they've disagreed, right? They've had their moments where, you know, what's going to have to happen to go to my party, Cheryl's your party, you make the call and then it gets written about. But what's beautiful about it is these two people represent really modern, a modern love story which is they don't always, you know, feel exactly the same on a topic, yet they still love each other. And I think that that's the role model that they're representing. And it's funny how people try to tear them down because somehow it's been public that they've agreed, disagreed on issues or that he disagrees with his family on issues, you know, and as he said, oh, you don't, I, so everyone in your family agrees on everything that you do. Um, but let's get to the, the more important point. Relationships and, and marriage really is just a litmus test for the, you know, the stability of our society, right? Uh, the stability of our relationships depend upon the stability we have in our world. And as Bobby has pointed out, and look, I'm not going to, I'm not a policy guy here to speak for his policy, but I'll tell you what I do like what he's saying. And it's true when, you know, you had Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum saying that the goal of the WEF is, you know, by 2030, everyone will, you know, no one will own everything. Everyone will be renting and that will make them happy. Nothing could make us less happy. You know, we if we don't have a stake in this nation and, and our founding fathers talked about this, if we couldn't own land, our, you know, it's the fact that we're all landowners, that we all have an investment in this nation. A, a renter doesn't care about their home. A renter doesn't care if a, an appliance breaks, they'll leave it till somebody else fixes it. They don't care if there's a car on blocks, you know, next door. They don't care if the school is not a good school. I mean, all these things are an investment when you own that home, when that's your space, when, you know. Um, and so I think he's got brilliant policies on how he's going to First of all, kick BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard out of the home buying business, which is buying all of our homes exactly like Klaus Schwab has promised us. Um, and, you know, very quickly, it's a really brilliant idea that, you know, rich kids have rich uncles that, you know, co-sign their mortgages so that they get really low rates. And Bobby has said, I'm going to give you all a rich uncle and that rich uncle is Uncle Sam and they're going to co-sign loans for you at a 3% rate below everywhere else, which will make it more affordable to buy a home. It's going to make it more difficult for industries to come in and buy private dwellings. So right there, this idea of, of putting homes and taking, you know, some of these, the all every, every city has got these destitute strip malls and stuff that are just sitting there. Those are actually now, in my understanding, and he's working with policy people, that those can be bought up at pennies on the dollar, turned into apartment buildings for teachers and small condominiums and a place for, you know, early investment in families to take place. Uh, so those types of policies and then looking at 
what are our wages and you know what is is the the rightful you know payment for somebody and getting back to the idea that if you work you know hard you know that it used to be in the when america the dream of america after world war ii was fully realized that was in fact the promised land that our founding fathers had dreamt about where if you worked hard you had a single fan, you know a single payer household but that one job blue collar job was able to put the kids to college to put some money aside for a vacation and to own a home uh, what took that away from us? You know, why is that not possible today? Only because we are allowing ourselves to be robbed blind by the corporate interests that keep telling us, don't raise taxes on us because that's terrible for you. You know, let us just take all of your money and we'll dole it out as we see fit as the, you know, the ability for a job to pay your way. How many people are working two and three jobs and still can't put this in their hands on a thousand dollars if they're in an emergency, all of those things. So you talk about it, financial um, independence, owning a home. What happens to marriages when you're safely in a home that you own and you're not trying to get a landlord that is, you know, screwing you and won't come and get the heater fixed, that it's actually your home and the person that's coming to fix it owns their own home. Can you imagine what that world looks like? And then look at health. What is the thing that, what's the other issue that drives us into poverty and stress is health. We're the sickest nation in the world. We have more autoimmune disease than any other nation in the world. We also have more pharmaceutical intervention in our lives than any other nation in the world. You know, transverse theory in geometry of A equals B and B equals C, then A must equal C. It must be the pharmaceutical influence in our lives that's making us sicker. Because the more we use these products, the more and more sick we are. When we compare ourselves to every other nation that's using, having less pharmaceutical intervention, they are doing better in every health statistic there is. And so all of these catastrophic illnesses, I can't imagine how much cancer we are now going to go through and the heart disease from this totally untested, horrific vaccine that so many people were given, but we'll make it through uh, that time. But we will have a president that will finally focus our regulatory agencies, not on making sure that we are forced to buy the next pharmaceutical invention, but to actually use the regulatory agencies for what they were meant to do, which is to start doing true, deep demographic studies, um, you know, and controlled studies, looking at what is making us so sick. Let's look at fluoride in the water, shall we? Let's not be afraid of that conversation. Let's look at, you know, SRIs in our school children. How is that working out? You know, let's look at uh, the 72 vaccines and growing that we're giving our kids by the time they're 18. Because when we only got 11 of these things, we were a lot healthier than we are now that we're getting, getting 70 something of them. Let's look at the 5G and see, you know, is it true that it's safe? And, you know, in all of these things that we're talking about, there are no actual safety trials done by skeptical scientists. All of our trials being done by our regulatory agencies are being done by the industries that are making the billions of dollars from them. They literally hire. If it's 5G, let's get a 5G you know, specialist from Google or you know, uh, Apple to run the, the study. Well, what do you think their answer is going to be? Destroy all the products we're making billions of dollars off of or change the software or whatever it is? It's never going to be. And so we got to get out of this idea that skepticism is bad. Skepticism is the heart of science. It literally is the foundational principle of science. When you have a leading heart doctor like Peter McCullough, who has published more on the heart than any heart doctor in history, say to the world, I am worried about this COVID vaccine. The science I'm looking at looks like it is causing a heart issue in children. We are allowing experts that work for our regulatory agencies at our government say, don't listen to them, they're a quack. No, they are one of the leading doctors in the world. And we know that there's now a long list of those people. This is where we're off balance. And this is where when we get our regulatory agencies, which I assure you, Robert Kennedy Jr. is going to get this worked out. Of all the people that has ever understood what's wrong with regulatory agencies, how about the guy that's been winning lawsuits 
for the last 40 years against them on these very topics. You know, he's not against coal mining, but if that coal mine is, you know, polluting a river that is making everyone sick downriver, guess who has to pay to clean up that river? This is what people don't understand. It's so simple when you listen to him. He's not saying an end to all coal mines. What he's saying is, I want them to pay for all the costs to do the mining. And then let's decide if it's still the cheapest form of energy. You cannot poison everyone around you. Say, now I am going to see basically what's going to happen is I'm going to privatize all my earnings and socialize all my damages. So the people will have to pay the poor, the poisoning, the death of the river and the poison that's going on with them. But all us fat cats that own the mine are going to walk off with all the profits. That doesn't work. And that's not actually true market capitalism. True market capitalism would say that company has to pay all of its costs. If you cause garbage, you're the one that has to have the garbage taken away. If you're poisoning a river, you're the one that has to clean up the river. When we put those costs back in, that's not some environmental attack on business. That is asking a business to do what you do in your house. Do you not take your own garbage out? Or do you pay someone to take your garbage out? Because you certainly don't sit there and let the garbage pile up inside your house and say, this is ridiculous. And we better not need a regulatory agency to come in and tell you your father's saying, get this out of my house. That's what a regulatory agency is doing. That's what it should be doing. And this is what we're going to see really change. Free market capitalism, free market environmentalism, free market medicine that is not bolstered by, you know, by corporate cronies that are taking positions inside of government. When we get rid of all of that, you watch what happens to the relationships in this nation. Watch when we're not fighting to stay alive or fighting to pay some medical bill because we're so incredibly sick and allergic to everything uh, in our atmosphere and dying of cancer. And, you know, as children and babies and teenagers, just insane what we're accepting as a part of health. And you watch when we have a, you know, a roof over our head that we can afford and a job that is paying us a respectable wage for dedicating our lives to it 40 hours a week. You will see better families. You'll see a better America. And that I really, truly believe is what Robert Kennedy Jr. is going to deliver. 100%. I'm with you so much, Dell. And I was just thinking about the World Economic Forum, like their agenda 2030, and how mm -hmm. utterly disturbing it is, and how contrary it is to what our nation is dedicated to life, liberty property, and the pursuit of happiness. The yeah. absolute opposite of that on the Agenda 2030 from the WEF. So I kind of think what we need as Kennedy Americans is like Kennedy America Vision 2032 mm -hmm. or something like that. In other words, we start having that vision. We start built, and that's you know the basis of this conversation. And I, I'd like to see it expand to people who are following this campaign. Like, where are we going? What do we actually want in the world? You know, what's our end goal? And, and I think you're you're bringing a lot of that out. And I just wanted to ask if you could maybe build a little bit, almost like, you know, when we're talking about, you know, all the pollution of the coal mining companies who are not cleaning up after themselves. Yeah. I mean, could you, could you just describe, like, what's it going to feel like when you step outside in 2032? And, how, like, what's the environment like like in real time in a Kennedy America? Well, I mean, I, I think that what's amazing about it is, and, and I, and, and this is, it, what's weird is that this is somehow, it always used to, I've always been an environmentalist, so it always shocked me that this was a partisan issue, that we didn't all agree that we wanted clean air to breathe and clean water to drink uh, and, and a clean food system where things that are healthy for us. I mean, we just found out because of Robert Kennedy Jr. and a lawsuit against Monsanto and Bayer and their product glyphosate or Roundup and the glyphosate, the chemical sprayed over 90% of our crops that it causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We just found out, I still, you go to, you know, Home Depot and there it is, Roundup. You're going to go out and spray that, a little bit of that liquid, that mist. I mean, think about, think about mists for a second. Just think about COVID, what we've just learned how easy it is for these things to blow around. And we're out there spraying a cancer agent that we're breathing. Our kids are going to roll on that lawn. Our dog is going to roll on that lawn, come in and then sleep in bed with your kid. What do we think is happening here? Who is on your side? Is it really, are we really angry that Robert Kennedy Jr. would like some regulations to make sure that something that is on your lawn doesn't cause cancer because it's going to affect you whether you're intelligent enough to know it or not. 
And so that is what I think is going to change. I think that when you listen to him, more and more conservatives are waking up to saying, hey, I'm a hunter. You know, I'm a fisherman. I, I really would love to be able to catch some trout in that beautiful stream and go back and eat all the trout I want or pull a tuna deep out of the ocean and say, hey, everybody, I'm having a party. Come on over. Even the pregnant women, let's chow down. And we can't. We can't because we have allowed industry to poison our water, to poison our air and not just give us the common courtesy of doing what's necessary to clean it up. None of this had to get this far. It didn't have to be this bad. Um, so I think that you, when you imagine a world, and, and again, what I love about Bobby and I talk, we talk a lot about this, Charles Eisenstein. You'll read what Charles Eisenstein writes on these topics. The, you know, We're all the people around Bobby having these conversations, but it's not about some carbon credit score so that you can create a 15-minute city and turn every, you know, I'm, I'm escape from New York is about to be a prophecy for every city uh, in the world, if this, you know, WEF, you know, liberal Democrat, I mean, I think there's even probably conservatives in on it, but whatever, this idea of shutting our cities down, not letting us drive, not letting us fly, not letting us travel, uh, none of that is what is necessary here. There is an economy and a powerful economy that will be built on energy systems that are cleaner for all of us. Uh, if you take the subsidies out of the way, don't subsidize any side of it. Stop subsidizing gas. Stop paying for their pollution. Let them pay for it. Make that a part of the cost. And then let's see what is the most affordable way to move through space uh, and to heat our homes. I think that when we look at that world, we really, come on, we, are, we have so much great science that's capable of working in, in our favor. But again, I think it's going to be based on diversity, right? I think battery-driven cars make a lot of sense if you have solar panels on your house and you're using the sun to charge them. They don't make a whole lot of sense to me if you're using coal power to charge them or uh, some oil and gas plant. Then, then you're just a hamster in a wheel. So there's only a sort of certain group of people that that's a totally sensible option that I think does somehow uh, give an opportunity and you better live pretty, you know, your job better be pretty close to your house naturally because I had a Tesla for a little while. You don't want to go on a long trip with that. That's not a whole lot of fun. So it'll have its place. But when you have a president say that, I think it, what did he say? 60% of cars on the road by some arbitrary date, six years from now or something will be electric. Uh, that's ridiculous. I think that's a ridiculous statement. What it says is, you know, you're, you're just simply moving deck chairs around on a sinking ship and it was going to have its own problems. The mining of lithium and cobalt and all these things and batteries, I don't think is super problematic on a small scale for the group of people that want that type of car. But everybody gets that car. Suddenly you just turn those those rare minerals into diamonds and now babies are getting their arms chopped off in Africa and we know where this goes. And all of these things are just balance. It's about being in balance with the earth. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. You don't want to just eat cheese all day, every day, or just eat only, you know, pepperonis. It's the diversity in a diet that makes us healthier. It's diversity in a culture that makes us stronger. And it's diversity in energy systems that give us the best way forward. And maybe one day we will gravitate to some really brilliant clean energy and it comes from water. But that will be gradual and there'll be a lot of different steps along the way. I think we've got to stop looking at each step as the one cure-all. It's the problem with a bad vaccine. It's the problem with a bad drug. It's a problem with any product that is given way more validity, validity than it deserves. It's just one step in a direction. And I think a good president will recognize that. And I think Bobby said that. I'm not going to end oil and gas and coal and all of these things. What I'm going to do is take away the subsidies. They're going to pay their way the way they should and let the free market decide what people want to buy. Excellent. Well, Dell, I had one other topic that I'd like to circle back to, and then we're going to probably wrap up in a minute, um, <clears throat> which is about the media and government honesty and dishonesty. So having Mr. Kennedy in the White House is going to be potentially, and I believe it will be, an absolute transformation in the way the government communicates to the citizens and the government communicates through the media to the citizens. Because right now, here's what we've got. 
the, the government's lying about basically everything of, of substance, mm -hmm. and the CIA is dictating its own lies and propaganda through its media assets. Dozens of former CIA employees embedded all throughout all the mainstream media, all through the social media, censoring everything. And so obviously, step one is we need we need a real restoration of the First Amendment. We need free speech, yes. And we need independent media, yes. And here's my take, and I want to share it with you and just get your reaction to this, is that I don't believe government lies are protected by the First Amendment. Like when you look at the First Amendment, it's, you know, the government will make no law abridging the press, the right of the people. It doesn't say the government can lie all day. And in fact- no, you're right. You're right. That that's a, that's a known fact. In fact, I think that that has been decided by the Supreme Court. The government is not protected by free speech. Free speech protects the individual um, from you know uh, oppression by the government. But the government does not get to partake in lies and then call it that they have a right to free speech. You do have an issue, and the issue is that I think that in many ways um, the problem with the word lie, and I've learned I've learned this, and it, really my learning was when I put out a. Uh, put out a video um, of the head uh, lead scientist for the WHO. This is back in 2019, right before they were having this summit um, to figure out how to stop, you know, vaccine hesitancy. And uh, I forget how to say her name, but Swaminathan, I think is one part of her name. Um, but she clearly had made a video where she, you know, for the WHO saying how robust the safety science is. And, you know, we've got these great monitoring systems. And even when we have a problem, we catch them so quickly and we remedy that situation so that you can always be guaranteed that vaccines are perfectly safe because we do so much testing and have such a great surveillance system. And then three days later, she literally says in this meeting, uh, we don't have any surveillance systems. We have absolutely no way to tell someone when an injury happens from a vaccine or a death, whether that death was caused by the vaccine or not. We've got to fix this problem. And so I basically put it out, you know, and said, WHO scientists caught lying. And the articles that fact checked it did not say that I was wrong, that she made two glaringly different statements. What they claimed is that in order to call something a lie, you have to prove motivation and that I did not prove that she knew that she was lying when she made these two opposing <laughs> statements. Now, I, you know, and I have fun with this in front of audiences. Do you think she's lying? And the video is on our, on the website at thehighwire.com. You want to check it out. But it did make, it did, you know, these are the things you learn as you get in, as outside of journalism, you really get into law. It's true. You have to prove they know they're lying. And we have a bunch of psychopaths that are running uh, your government um, it would be very difficult to prove whether or not they know they're lying. I mean, they are so wrapped up in their own propaganda and their own self-aggrandizement. It's really difficult to figure out what they know and what they actually don't know. And, and that's where you would simply, I'm just saying, being sort of literal about it, it's where you'd have trouble, you know, going after them. They, they don't need to claim my First Amendment rights. All they claim is I didn't know I was lying. Yes, uh, they they have they have multiple layers of of, they, of what they call plausible deniability. So, Dell, I think we've got about four minutes left. I just want to make I want to give you my policy idea about okay. how we deal with this, and then just get your reaction. So, first of all, the co one context people need to understand is that, to my mem to my understanding, under the Obama administration, a law was passed legalizing CIA propagandizing of the American public, which was previously illegal. And if you really look at where did all these lies start, November 22nd, 1963, the assassination of President Kennedy, I call the Warren Report the big lie because it's underneath everything. Because if every American understood the CIA definitively overthrew our government and has in a way de facto been running our country in the shadows, which I've talked about on a previous episode with David Talbot, you know, since then in a certain way, like that it's kind of a de facto shadow CIA power elite structure. And that really the pol the political process, most of that is puppetry. And I think that will get overturned by Bobby coming into office. But then how do we really create structural change so we don't get into this lie situation in the future? So here's my kind of radical idea is we have a, um, we have a precedent, which is when you, you know, you go into court you swear that you're going to tell the truth uh, upon perjury. In other words, you can't knowingly lie in court. And if you knowingly lie in court as a, as a witness, you've committed perjury, you have legal consequences. I think everyone who works for the government at certainly at certain levels should have to take 
an oath along those lines that they, we just can't have lies anymore, that you're not going to commit perjury as a government employee or official in your communications to the American people. And furthermore, that that standard applies to the sort of relationship between the government and its current propaganda arms like the New York Times and CNN and so forth. So that's, that's my crazy idea. And I just wanted to hear what you think of it. Look, I, I think we all want more transparency. I think we want integrity, honesty, but we want discernment. Um, I think that one of the things that I, I, I'm, I'm not a politician, I haven't been in politics. So this is really outside of my sort of field of reference. I think as a, as a lay person, there's what I want. But I also know that there are things that you know, you don't want your enemies to know about a strategy or thought that you're having. And so full transparency can't be the answer. There has to be some level of discernment about what you share with the, with the public, which means the world and, and what you sort of keep to yourself. Um, that's why I think we're supposed to be in this system. You know, our part of that process is electing individuals that we think are giving us the honest scoop. For some reason, you know, we keep re-electing. I mean, this idea of should there be term limits, the term limit should be in the hands of the voters, right? I mean, if you're voting for Dianne Feinstein at 90, whatever, may she rest in peace, that was that's how this system works. You did that. And, and so a lot of this we blame on the system, but we also, what I think we've really got to take, you know, into account is our place in that. If we're going to have a nation run by the people, then the people have to wake up and take responsibility there. And so, yes, I think that there should be an idea that you are perjuring yourself when you lie. But I think we know you can see when you're watching people that are telling the truth. We have to do a better job of electing those individuals that do tell the truth. we got to make it you know, acceptable again to break from your party ranks because you don't agree with something instead of getting upset and allowing Rachel Maddow or any other news anchor to make us infuriate. I mean, look at you, you just watched the Republican party, you know, lose the speaker of the house. I think that's a fantastic moment. I think it's a fantastic statement. I don't care if it's four people or whatever it is. What you see there is we're not happy. We're not getting someone that's representing us. Now, I don't know if we come out with a better choice on the other end, but what you're seeing is that's a process in place that does exist. I would like to see more of that. I'd like to see more people being removed from office. I would see, like to see more people that, and, and not by other politicians, but, you know, by, you know, uh, of the voting system. We, we need to be involved. I think that Robert Kennedy Jr. is how you start that change. You don't really need a law if you send someone in so that all the heads of your regulatory agencies are going to be chosen by an honest man. A man who's telling you, I'm not going to put up with the corporate takeover of the CDC any longer or the NIH or the FDA. Guess who puts all those? I mean, think about this. Guess who puts all those people in a position? Guess who decides the head of the FDA? Who decides the head of the CDC and the NIH and Health and Human Services? The president of the United States. And then what does that person do? Guess who they get to hire and fire? Everyone below them. So in many ways, we just have to make better choices about who we put in the leadership. The rest will work itself out. What we don't need is more laws governing, you know, how to make people tell the truth. We have too many laws. That is the problem we have in this nation. You know, I think we've got to get away from wanting more government to fix our problems. What we have to say is, why don't we get involved in picking better government, choosing better government uh, and less government? I think not more, but less. Our answer should be in how do we remove the amount of uh, government infiltration into every aspect of our lives? What is the least amount of government necessary for us to be able to walk down the street in freedom and liberty and not kill each other? All right. I get that there's some reason I want a police force. I want someone to put out the fire in my house. But honestly, I don't think I need a legislative body that like I remember in California, like we're going to limit every legislator to 40 bills per season. 40 bills per season is what, how many, couple of hundreds of you? I mean, you're telling me since 1776 till now, we haven't written enough laws to be able to walk down the street together. Are we out of our minds? Why would we possibly need another law at this point? I think I've made my point. Well, well thank you so much, Dell. And, and I totally feel you there. And I, and you know, where I'm coming from is for me, this is not an argument for more or less government. It's just 
the truth. I just want the truth. Yeah. I can handle the truth. We can handle the truth. Americans can handle the truth. I just want the government and the media to tell me the truth, no matter how uncomfortable it is. And Bobby has said his campaign is an experiment in truth. And that's one of the main reasons I'm a follower of Gandhi. He actually called his autobiography Experiments in Truth. So, you know, I want to respect your time. I think we're at our limit here. So, Dell, I just want to say this has been amazing. And we have a long road in front of us. You know, we have more than a year. So if yeah. it works for you, I would love for you to come back if it's convenient. And any final words before we uh, wrap up? No, I look forward to that. And what I say is let's make truth sexy again. <laughs> what we have to do is just use truth, right? We got to make people get people used to truth. And as Bobby said, if you want truth and truth prevails, I will be president of the United States. It's up to us. We've got to start making truth sexy with everyone we know. And how do we do that? By being truthful. And I think that that's one of the things that I feel good about the work I do. I'm so happy with how the work at the high wire has held up over time. I know what I'm saying is on camera and I know when I'm being attacked by the media. And now when they call me and try to say you spread misinformation, I said, where did I get it wrong? I can name all the places you were wrong. Where did I actually get it wrong? And uh, and so I'm dedicated to truth. And more and more people in America are and more and more people around the world. And I have a lot of hope for this moment that we live in. I think there's a lot of great, good, beautiful people that are waking up every single day. Uh, we just can't live in fear anymore. We actually outnumber them. The Independence Party is now the biggest party in America. Why don't we vote that way? And let's see what this nation looks like on the other side. Absolutely. St thank you for standing for the truth, Dell, And for any of our listeners who have not yet seen the high wire the highwire.com check it out you will find the truth dell thank you so much onward to victory in 2024 thank you take care